squash the enemy who can test again, bro. Don't forget, we got six games. Wait. It does well. Off yeah. the rip for WE, man. World's Edge. Creating a map for a battle royale is difficult. You need to make a large enough space for an army of players to drop into and play in. Making a map like that fun for everybody involved is a challenge by itself. Now imagine having to do that while also making it competitively balanced for professional play. Apex Legends struggled with this exact problem. King's Canyon was the first map to be released for Apex, and the growing competitive scene for the game quickly found the faults in King's Canyon. It was small, too easy to get third partied, hard to hold positions, and didn't have enough for every team to have a chance at winning at all. That all changed for competitive Apex in Season 3, when World's Edge made its debut. Keep up, old man. man. Hi, I'm Moreover, and I am here to help break down the world of competitive Apex. Today, we're going to find what makes for a good competitive map by showcasing the most storied map in ALGS. Come join me as we explore the landscape of World's Edge. World's Edge is a large map. One man can only talk about so much before he misses out on important details. To ensure that this video covers everything that makes World's Edge as good as it is, I have enlisted the help of a fellow Apex content creator to help me out. Known for his incredible deep dives into ALGS pro teams and events, I can think of no one better to help me tackle this map. What's up? You'll be seeing him later on. For now, let's get started. Before we really get started on the strengths of World's Edge, let's get out of the way one of the biggest elephants in the room when it comes to this map, the loot that it offers. World's Edge has a total of 20 points of interest. With 20 teams dropping onto the map, there is at least one POI for each team to loot up. And while that is true, more experienced players watching this video would be quick to refute this claim, and they'd be right to do so. Loot isn't distributed evenly in Apex, and a team landing at Epicenter is going to be far less equipped than a team landing at Climatizer right next door. What actually makes the loot on World's Edge competitively viable is not the points of interest themselves, but the areas around them. World's Edge features a ton of space around POIs that aren't named. Spots such as Grandma's House, Train Tunnel, and No Name can fully equip a single player, while the various caves across the map offer special vaults with high tier loot accessible with a vault key. These spread out locations alongside the 20 POIs offer every team a chance to equip all three of their players before they have to take on any fights. That doesn't mean that the loot is fixed, however. The biggest point of contention with World's Edge is its disparity in loot between POIs, and if I want to talk about the great parts of this map, I do have to mention its faults as well. Nowadays, World's Edge is considered on the lower end of loot quality compared to newer maps introduced into Apex. If we were to grade competitive maps purely on the loot they offer, World's Edge would have been removed from ALGS already. However, there are other factors to consider than just loot. What kept World's Edge and ALGS beyond that were other, far more important parts to comp, such as its rotation options. To explain, let's take a map of World's Edge and split it up into four quadrants, shown here. Notice where our dividers end up on World's Edge. Each line coincides with choke points that separate each part of the map, cleanly dividing the map into various sections, and the only way to enter into these different sections is to pass through one of the chokes. On top of that, let's take note of where a majority of the choke points on World's Edge lead towards. Ten choke points in total lead to one section of the map, and point you towards Fragment. Fragment becomes the centralized part of the map layout, and as players move through the map, they are eventually funneled into this specific area. All routes lead to Fragment, and every path is available from Fragment. This is the funnel design of World's Edge. If every path can eventually lead to the same area, then players are less likely to spend a majority of the match without seeing a single fight. But more importantly, what this design creates is predictability. If I am landing Geyser, and the ring is ending at Epicenter, 
I know exactly where my nearby opponents will most likely go. The Lava Siphon team will take their jump tower and move into Fragment from the left choke here, while Harvester will move in from the Lava Choke. I have the option of either the Geyser Choke or the two cave exits that come out into Overlook and No Name respectively, and I know the teams rotating behind me at Big Mod and Stacks will have the same path as me when they begin to rotate. World's Edge's design makes the rotations teams will take within them more predictable, which means that they won't accidentally run into each other as they rotate to their intended spot. To run into a team on World's Edge outside of the ring, one of the teams has to be intentionally searching for a fight, instead of unintentionally moving through the same space at the same time. Now, let's take this exact idea and apply it to King's Canyon. First, by dividing it into the four quadrants just like bef uh, uh, that Well, that doesn't work right. While we do see some similarities with choke points and dividers across some of the lines, they are far fewer in comparison to World's Edge. In fact, the vertical line features entire sections of playable space, with the central canyon cutting through it multiple times. What's more, King's Canyon does not have a centralized location where the map feeds into. While you can say that the open area around containment is the central location, a large chunk of the map doesn't actually feed into it. Instead, there is this mess of clusters with joining points to other clusters. This disjointed feeling makes King's Canyon have a one major difference in comparison to World's Edge. King's Canyon is unpredictable. The design of KC makes it incredibly difficult to know when a team is moving towards you, or whether a team is nearby to third you if you take a fight outside the ring. All of that is compounded by the fact that King's Canyon is smaller than World's Edge, meaning all of these things are now also in a tighter playing space. This can be good for high action casual games, but isn't good for competitive games where teams want to have some level of predictability in their macro play. There's a fantastic video about this design philosophy in Apex by the creator Garbage, who explains this idea in his own way and shows how other maps in Apex Legends also fit this philosophy. You can check out his video in the link down below. The layout of World's Edge works in the favor of competitive play. That's understandable, but there's still something we have yet to talk about. The rotations are great, cool, but can you rotate to somewhere playable? Let's talk about the final part that makes World's Edge work. It's playable space. Playable space as defined for this video is any location on a map where a team is reasonably able to play from safely, without risk of being angled out or walked over. In a battle royale, the playable space is an ever-changing circumstance as the ring continues to close. Spaces that were once good to hold can become unusable once the ring moves away from it, and on the other side of the coin, spaces that were once unplayable can become playable when the ring takes away obvious threats to its position. Thanks to the randomness of the battle royale format, Apex's playable space is a constantly shifting field, and it's one of the reasons Comp Apex is as fascinating to watch as it is. What that doesn't mean, however, is that we can't quantify the amount of playable space that a map has to offer. We certainly can, and we can judge a map's playable spaces based on the two main areas teams will play from, buildings and terrain. The buildings in World's Edge are as varied as the legendary skins they give to Wraith. However, they can be split up into three main types. City buildings, industrial buildings, and wilderness buildings, each with their own unique design to fit the POI they sit in. City buildings are denser than the rest, with multiple floors to fight for and hold. Industrial buildings are far larger on average, which allows teams to control more area but are more difficult to hold against aggression. Wild buildings are the most isolated of the group, smaller than the rest, and spaced throughout the various open areas around World's Edge. Each one offers teams a very different experience when playing in them, but all of them offer an important level of security to squads. The only sightlines into them are from their open windows and doorways. Unlike buildings on King's Canyon, Olympus, or even Stormpoint, where there are other angles to shoot into. The buildings are solid, but for most endgames there aren't enough buildings to go around for 10 squads at round 4. That's where terrain comes in. Terrain is areas around buildings and points of interest, and it is often the first thing to come into question when you discuss playable space. What terrain can a team play from if a building isn't available to them? This is the spot where World's Edge shines brightest. Above all else, the terrain of World's Edge is filled to the brim with options for teams to play around. From rocks, fence lines, trucks, crates, tunnels, 
train cars, whatever these eggshell things are, there are so many options for players to choose. You don't need a building to survive, and oftentimes, a spot in the terrain is actually the best place to play from for the end games. Not only though does World's Edge have great cover around the map, but it also has a unique blend of verticality. In general, for most POIs on World's Edge, you will find what I call the three-layer layout. Take Lava Siphon for example. You of course have the main area of the POI, being the buildings which have ultimate height. Just below that is the ground level where most of the traversal happens, but below that there is an emphasis on creating a third dimension of verticality with the deep caved in floors between the buildings as well as the trench that stretches across the east side. You'll see this concept generally implemented throughout each POI and this emphasis on multiple levels of playable space creates unique interactions between teams all over over the map. And verticality can be seen in different ways as well, with long slopes and hills found throughout the map, as well as large rocks and towers found in open space to create new sight lines and power positions. Huh, I almost forgot about that. Thanks, Jayhawk. I think we've talked enough now about the general design and layouts of World's Edge. Now, let's get familiar with the areas that make up this gigantic map. One by one, we'll go through each of them and let you know what they're like to play in. Starting with... A Premier Edge POI, with the best individual loot of any POI in the Northeast Quadrant of World's Edge. The openness of this side of the map also means that Climatizer doesn't suffer as much on rotations compared to other Edge POIs. Aggressive Edge teams can especially benefit from Climatizer's proximity to Fragment, being able to control the funnel of the map for potential kill points. The end games in Climatizer are a different beast entirely, as it is easy for teams to get inside Climatizer, but hard to get outside, thanks to the large hillside near Epicenter that looks over the entirety of the POI. Rings pulling towards Climatizer often end on the outskirts of buildings, and the open area around these spots are the best places to play from, but they only become viable to play in when the ultimate heights of hillside and the roof are no longer within the ring. A smaller POI at the most northern point of the map. The loot inside of the camp is negligible, and teams landing at survey will use nearby locations like Train Tunnel and Epicenter to supplement the limited supplies. To make up for this, Survey Camp offers great rotations to all northern end zones, and fast looting times to help zone teams rotate faster to farther rings. When the ring arrives in Survey Camp, a similar problem to Climatizer occurs. The buildings and truck inside of Survey are all on the downhill, with all the outskirt locations able to look down upon them. Unlike Climatizer, however, these buildings are far more likely to be in later rings for far longer, making them more valuable to hold. The god spots to control in Survey are often the northern tunnel entrances and rocks, as rings tend to pull toward them and they are the hardest locations for opponents to push into. Epicenter is not a POI for a full team. With meager offerings to share between three players, you're more likely to leave Epicenter with three white shields and no attachments than you are with anything substantial. The POI is often held by teams landing at Survey Camp or Monument to supplement their own supplies, with the rest scrap looted by Climatizer and Overlook as they move through it. Epicenter, much like his name, is at the very center of this northeast area, and sits as the king of the hill. This verticality, alongside the giant chunks of ice, create natural blockades on how teams can move and see through this section of the map. While it may be a weak POI overall, Epicenter is a necessary center point of the Fragment side that keeps the mid to late game from becoming huge sightlines and sniper battles. Unlike a similarly placed POI on a different map. Zone teams from every region look to Overlook as the premier zone POI, and for good reason. It is the POI that offers fast rotations to over half of the map, with good loot to back up a slower playstyle if required. Its versatility may not be as strong as Lava Siphon or Harvester, but it has been sought after by a plethora of teams over the years because of its consistently good options. Overlook's endgames often overlap with no name to the southwest of it, 
and is a prime example of terrain being the best place to hold over buildings when the ring pulls into the area in between. The zip platform to the train tunnel, the silos, the north side hill, and the cave entrance are all great locations for teams and are all open areas with plenty of cover to move around. The buildings themselves aren't bad by any means, but only stay a strong option if the zone specifically pulls into them, which happens less often than you would expect. Fragment and Monument are technically two POIs, but their history stems all the way back to being a singular POI called Capital City. As time went on, the city, due to its size, got split a few times, leading to where we are now. This POI is unique in that it can be held by a singular team, but due to the sheer size and location, it is difficult to prevent other teams from forcibly splitting it. If it does get split, Monument is the superior side as it holds access to the crafter, the ring console, and better loot. Rotations from these POIs are fantastic as you are dead center on the map with solid priority to most of the possible end zones. It's rare a circle can end inside of these POIs as there's only a few possible end game locations right in the center of the city. Easily the largest POI in World's Edge and one of the least overall changed from its original version in Season 3. This city layout, with densely placed together buildings with multiple floors, is unlike any other location in Apex. The only similar place to it is Fragment, and even it is a shell of what it once was. This huge size, alongside its density, makes for tight endgames with far more teams alive than what you would see in other parts of World's Edge. Landing at Skyhook is a very different story. The city is just too large for a team to reasonably loot all of it by themselves, and because of that size and distribution, Skyhook is often split into two different landing spots for teams, Skyhook West and Skyhook East. East and West will be taken by two separate teams to loot up and rotate from, but sharing a POI does not come cleanly. The two teams will often fight to control certain aspects of Skyhook for themselves, namely the Crafter. That Crafter, alongside the Trials POI, gives a significant advantage to Skyhook West as a landing spot over Skyhook East. West can hold out the crafter for themselves, forcing East to either fight them for it or wait for them to leave. As well as that, West has access to the lucrative Trials POI, with high tier loot offered for completing the trial, making it a POI possible to play edge from. Skyhook East on the other hand, falls into a similar category as Landslide and Fragment East, with terrible loot left for them on their side and being forced to fight for any additional loot at Train Tunnel and Crafter. Any team that plays East is forced to lag behind every other team around them. These landing spots may share the POI, but they are not shared equally. Trials is one of the four POIs on World's Edge that sits as a split hold alongside Epicenter, offering high tier loot to anybody who can clear the Prowler Trials inside. Skyhook West will often be seen controlling this area if they are hoping to play Edge. Unlike Epicenter, Trials can offer a team a full kit thanks to the great loot it provides. This is usually only done when teams don't have another landing spot option, since Trials has some of the worst rotations available on World's Edge. Thanks to the fact that Trials is a literal mountain, the height of Trials becomes an ultimate place to hold when the end game pulls towards it. The ring will never end on top of Trials, but rather on the terrain around it. From the tower on the west side, open grounds to the west, or even the Eagle on the south side, endgames at Trials are tests of a team's ability to find spaces to cover themselves in a largely open environment. Another POI that has stood the test of time, Lava Fisher presents a unique challenge for teams trying to play it in the endgame. While it has plenty of options for buildings to use, they are each open enough for every other building in the POI to have sightlines on each other. The tighter the lobby gets, the more dangerous it becomes to peek, and it only gets worse when you have to move out of your building after a ring pull. That's all without mentioning the lava pit below, which is at best a rat spot for players who lost their teammates. You don't want to be stuck in the pit. The POI itself is decent enough, with good enough loot, a crafter, beacons, the whole package. But Lava Fisher also features a unique problem as a landing spot that no other POI on World's Edge suffers from. What is that problem exactly? 
Well, I'll be explaining that one later on. For now, let's move on to... Do you remember Helm's Deep? So it begins. Yeah, endgames in Countdown are kinda like that. When the triggerable walls are lifted on either side of Countdown, it becomes an incredibly difficult POI to enter once the primary spots are filled. The best options for teams trying to get into Countdown are to use Valkyrie or Evac Towers, or hold the lower ground underneath. Endgames at Countdown are great for those who can get there quickly, and the rest are the orcs trying to breach the walls. As a POI to land on, Countdown is as solid as it gets, with good priority to Northern Rings and enough options to play Edge as necessary. The loot itself is good, with mid to high tier loot available in the triggerable center. Any lack of crafter or beacon options can also be supplemented with Lava Fisher or Landslide during rotations. Landslide has somewhat of a poor reputation in competitive, as it is one of the most sparse POIs in the game in terms of loot quantity and quality. I am not exaggerating when I say you need to prepare to exit this POI with triple white armors and 10 shield cells. Although it's rare the team landing here is able to take advantage of it, the POI does feature a vault giving access to high tier loot. Landslide has a strong central location, and with very little loot to gather, you can fully loot and leave the POI faster than any other POI on the map. When circles pull towards Landslide, things can get ugly fast. Due to the POI being incredibly small, there isn't much playable cover outside of a couple RVs on the outskirts. Most teams will post up in the surrounding area, while two teams often gatekeep a large chunk of the map by holding the two tunnels connecting to Landslide. Because of all of this, most of the fighting will occur in the mid game, leading to only a few teams being alive to fight in the end game. Staging is an interesting POI. By all means, it isn't bad whatsoever. It has average loot, a crafter, and good positioning on the map. It even has fast rotations to generally hard to reach rings such as Thermal, Tree, and Countdown. Teams landing here can even loot Mirage Voyage as a bonus. You really can't go wrong with staging, but it has suffered from a particular issue. Beacons. The survey beacon and map console are game changers in how a team handles their rotations and getting these beacons are important for good macro play. Staging has these beacons, but for the longest time had the lowest percentage rate of actually spawning with one at the start of a match. This is thanks to a rule that was implemented in Apex to prevent beacons from spawning too close together. Staging's proximity to other POIs guaranteed it to almost never get a beacon reliably. Without reliable beacons, staging went from a solid POI to a coin flip on whether or not you could succeed from it. The beacon rule has since been removed, but whether or not staging is a top tier POI or not is still left up to debate. Its end games, on the other hand, share a familiar feeling with Countdown with its impregnable walls. Unlike Countdown, however, staging has a variety of options around the walls that block it in, from a powerful height on the train tracks, the crane and construction on the west side, as well as the hill house towards the harvester end. While you may sense some deja vu between Countdown and staging end games, they have enough differences to make each one a little bit unique, especially when it sits next to This giant ship is the greatest example of an ultimate height on World's Edge, a spot that overlooks a large chunk of the map around it. Mirage Voyage endgames are a game of staying out of the ship team's sightlines for a majority of the match. The ring will never end on the ship, however, and the teams that control the terrain around the ship are often the ones who control the final ring. The train tracks, zip platform, and Dorito building are all solid options depending on the ring pole. Remember how I said Lava Fisher had a unique problem? Mirage Voyage is that problem. Before staging was introduced onto World's Edge, Mirage Voyage used to be the only POI in this particular section of the map. Once staging was brought in and Mirage Voyage was put back onto World's Edge, a problem was created. Mirage Voyage was surrounded by POIs that blocked any fast rotations from happening. 
and wasn't viable as a landing spot for most teams. This meant that Mirage became a split hold POI, much like Trials and Epicenter. Teams would land on it alongside their own POI to take its high tier loot and beacons for themselves. The problem this creates is that Lava Fisher now has to split hold Mirage Voyage, or else they lose rotation options to the entire south side of the map. If any other teams control both staging and Mirage Voyage, Lava Fisher has to wait for those teams to move on or fight them to get past. Either way, they are stuck with slower rotations to final rings that they would otherwise have high priority to if somebody else has Mirage. Staging, however, may want Mirage for the loot it offers. One landing spot has the power to completely change how a separate POI has to play their game, and oftentimes, it can lead them into a worse performance if they do not control it. That one's a rough one to cover, and definitely hard for teams looking to play it. You can make an entire video on that one alone. For now, however, let's move on. Talking about Thermal Station is difficult, since unlike most other POIs, Thermal does not consist solely of the POI itself. Rather, Thermal Station encompasses the entire section of the map that it rests in. Every smaller location that surrounds Thermal Station is still isolated from the rest of the map, which means that any team landing at Thermal has uncontested access to all of it, making it one of the best edge POIs in the game for loot, while still having the option to play zone when the ring is ending at the southwest side courtesy of their free access to three different chokes to any part of this section of the map. Thermal Station finishes are just as large of a bag to cover. With so much area encompassing it, end games will vary depending on which side of the ring it decides to pull. It can end anywhere from the north side choke to the far back corner of the map. The god spots in Thermal Station evidently change dramatically based on this, but one area that stays almost universally good during thermal pulls is the thermal height. This small location at the top of the POI is an ultimate height that is hard to challenge and looks over the entirety of the thermal pocket. What's good after that is largely dependent on which side it ends. You best get used to ring prediction as you're gonna need it in thermal station. I like to call Harvester the number two of World's Edge as it is the best example of a POI that is the second best in every possible way. It has an incredibly good position on the map, good loot, a crafter, beacons, a high tier loot center, and priority to a ridiculous amount of ring pulls. If it weren't for the presence of another POI that has all of that and more right next door, Harvester would be considered the best landing spot in the game. But hey, you can never go wrong with second best. He does exactly what I do, but better. When the final ring does come the way of this gigantic space laser, it's a game of how many teams can fit inside of this gigantic building. The answer is not as many as you think. Controlling a part of Harvester is a greater challenge than holding buildings in Skyhook or Countdown, as you are nearly guaranteed to have to fight off other squads looking to take your spot. The outer areas around Harvester, like the hillside, fence line, question mark, and S tunnels are all prowling the perimeter for their chance to get in. You best make sure you're not the team that looks the most vulnerable to them. Tree is a rather dull POI with relatively mediocre loot and standard rotations. It is surrounded by juggernaut POIs such as Thermal, Harvester, Lava Siphon, and Launch Site. These would be a problem for Tree if it wasn't for the typical playstyle you see out of most teams that land at Staging and Harvester, which means that Tree won't be gatekept. The rotations largely involve the Balloon to move quickly, which allows for the Tree team to play an early rotate playstyle since the POI can be looted quickly. There are plenty of endgames here and things can be very interesting on Tree pulls due to the Thermal and Launch Site chokes being gatekept, forcing most teams to either fight or rotate to the Corals and buildings on the low ground at the POI. There are a lot of playable spots and various pulls that can be making tree endgames unpredictable and entertaining overall, giving plenty of teams a chance to win depending on which pull you ultimately get.
Lava Siphon is one of, if not the best, POI on World's Edge. Fantastic loot quality and density that is capable of being looted quickly, priority to many of the toughest possible zones on the map, and some of the best possible rotations due to its somewhat central location, access to multiple balloons to quickly leave the area, and multiple pathways to exit the POI make it so great. When the circle pulls towards Lava Siphon, the zones can get interesting, as it's rare the circle can actually pull inside of the POI, meaning it often will pull into the southeastern trench, leading to late games where the lobby can go from 15 teams to 5 in a matter of minutes. If it does pull into the POI, there's only a handful of endings with plenty of playable cover and a couple playable buildings that allows for unique endgames that really highlight legends who excel at controlling space. Talk about the perfect POI to become a bullion. Edge teams in launch site have no need to rush to the ring. Why is that? Well, depending on the ring pull, an edge team can hit not one, not two, not three, but four different crafters. Even without that excessive amount of crafting, launch site teams can come out of their POI fully equipped to bully and fight any team moving around them, especially Dome, but we'll get to that in a bit. Launch site does feature a similar layout to countdown and staging but with a far more open side on the dome end for teams to move in from. The two chokes towards Tree and Lava Siphon are still difficult hurdles to overcome for late rotating teams, but of the three POIs in this style, Launch Site offers the most options for getting in late. The back building of Launch Site in particular is a very strong place to hold, as it looks over the entirety of the POI, and is hard to push into when the ring pulls back there. Dome is a small POI located in the southeast corner of World's Edge and due to its size is easy to loot quickly. The downside is that there isn't much loot to go around despite the quality being strong. Because it is quick to loot, it enables teams landing there the ability to rotate early, but that's where Dome's issues lie. First off, due to its location in the bottom right corner, it lacks priority to most of the map. But the largest issue is the neighboring POIs of Stax and Big Mod, Lava Siphon, and Launch Site. These three POIs POIs are some of the best on the map, and with far better loot than Dome, will often feature equally as scary teams landing at them. When attempting to rotate out of Dome though, you must pick your poison. Either you utilize the balloon to leave and risk getting shot down by the launch site team, or you go it on foot. If you choose the latter, then the timing is of the utmost importance. If you try to leave early, both launch site and stacks, often being played by late rotate teams, can gatekeep you. Meanwhile, Lava Siphon can gatekeep you as well, if they so choose and will have the height advantage as you are typically forced to rotate through the lower trench. When Circle pulls towards Dome, it can be one of the most difficult zones to win for teams who do not have direct priority as due to its small size, there are a few buildings within the large outer shell, meaning most teams who arrive later in the game will die on the outside of the POI during the mid and late game. If there ever was a POI I would give the definition of mid to, it would be Geyser. Nothing about it is particularly bad. Good rotations to any eastern ring pole, average loot and crafter, a vault option if you can get a key, really nothing bad about it, but it also doesn't have any major advantages either. Its rotations are good, not great. Its loot is okay for a zone focused team, but nowhere near enough for aggressive playstyles. It's not a POI that you can't do well from, but it's not exactly the spot you want to fight for. As far as end games go, Geyser is a more interesting spot to cover. The main ways to enter Geyser come from three separate chokes, with one larger open path to the west. Five main buildings sit inside this pocket of the map, all uniquely spread out from each other. Only one of these buildings actually ends closest to the final ring, and knowing how to play around these buildings becomes the difference between being left out early and surviving till the very end. You can also rat inside of the Geyser at the center, which is pretty cool. A giant ship, much like Mirage Voyage. These POIs share a lot of similarities, but their end games don't play out exactly the same. While Big Mod is a fantastic height to hold from, it doesn't quite have the ultimate height status that other places on the map possess, with Geyser Choke overlooking it and constant pressure from other teams trying to control parts of Mod. The paintball field and terrain behind Big Mod in comparison tend to be great places to control for end games landing here 
but difficult to hold early on. You wouldn't think that paintball guns would be more effective than real guns, but the guns offered in the special cases inside of Big Mod are exactly that. Fully equipped with attachments and ammo included, any team landing at Big Mod is guaranteed to leave it with the best weapons of any team in the lobby. In saying that, the other loot available to you is limited and the rotations are weak thanks to its proximity to other POIs. Because of this, Big Mod is near universally made to be a split hold. Alongside... Replacing Lava City, Stax takes the base of a former building and fragment and turns it into its own POI. This centerpiece of construction, mixed with multiple layers of scaffolding and buildings around it, make for pretty dense endgames. Multiple teams can control the different floors at the center, as well as in the nearby buildings, while also having small tunnel passages underneath. Endgames at Stax create hectic situations as teams fight for any scrap of space within this busy construction site. The interesting topic is Stax as a landing spot. It has good loot by itself, but suffers from a similar problem as Dome and Lava Fisher. Its nearby POIs cut off much of the landing spot's rotation options. Its north is cut off by Big Mod, and Dome and Launch Site limit its options to the west. By itself, Stax is one of the worst POIs to rotate from on World's Edge. But remember how I said Big Mod was commonly made to be a split hold? Stax is the POI that splits holds it, the most infamous split hold on World's Edge. Combining Stax and Big Mod makes them one of the best landing spots in the entire game, with fully kitted weapons and all the loot any team could ask for. A single change in a team's landing turns a rough POI into a top 3 POI. But if you're a team landing here, don't expect to keep it easily. You better be ready to defend it. And... That's it! We have shown how loot distribution plays into a map's competitive viability. We broke down how the funnel design of World's Edge creates predictability in team's rotations. We showcased how World's Edge's playable spaces promotes competitive plays and strategies. And finally, we went through every named location in World's Edge and saw how they each play it out. All of this comes together to make the first real competitive map in Apex Legends. Since World's Edge's release, three new maps have come into the game and the popularity of this map has waned in recent times. However, I hope this video today helped you appreciate what was and is a great map for competitive Apex. It may have changed over the years, but nothing will ever replace World's Edge. I hope you enjoyed watching. A very big thank you to Jayhawk for accepting my request to join me on this video. This project ended up inflating to a size far larger than I expected, and I appreciate his help in this chaotic mess of a video. I'd also like to thank the crew at Risen Rose for their help with gathering the blank map footage that is used throughout this video. You can find both Jayhawk and Risen Rose at the links down below. A final thank you to my first ever supporter here on YouTube, Blue Kalu. His bit of support helped make this video possible. If you want to support what I do and see more videos like this, you can support me here on YouTube as well and be recognized at the end of these videos. As always, if you have any suggestions on what I should cover next in Apex Legends, you can let me know in the comments. Otherwise, this has been Moreover. Have a lovely day.